Over 30 million individual COVID-19 vaccine doses have been distributed so far across the UK. To discuss the future of the vaccine rollout and dispel some myths, I'm joined by the Minister for Vaccine Deployment, Nadeem Zahawi. Minister, good to see you today. Why is it going so well? Well, I think it's a combination of uh, both uh, on the supply side. Uh, and we've just reached the first anniversary of the Vaccines Task Force uh, this week, where uh, a group of brilliant people um, and we are blessed with some amazing people who uh, have in their careers led some of the biggest vaccination uh, businesses, vaccines businesses in the world, um, came together uh, to give us the uh, capability of uh, deployment by contracting and by building manufacturing capacity in the UK to manufacture. And then on the deployment side, the coming together of really two great institutions, the NHS, the doctors, nurses, pharmacists, 80,000 volunteer vaccinators, 200,000 volunteers, and our armed forces, um, 101 uh, uh, Logistics Brigade under uh, the command of uh, Brigadier Phil Prosser, uh, and of course, local government, uh, finding the sites, uh, getting those um, actually operational. Uh, in many ways, uh, it speaks to our strength. If the virus challenged liberal democracies like ours, and many others around the world, because the only way we could fight it in the early days was uh, the lockdowns, the, you know, the severe one that we are still experiencing uh, now, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, they're called the MPIs. The virus uh, really challenged us. The vaccine, on the other hand, I think speaks to our strengths. We demonstrated it in the Olympics where we could show the world that we can really organize well. And I think we've just done that in even greater scale. Uh, the sort of the Dunkirk spirit, the thousands of flotillas coming together to say, we're not going to let this virus defeat us. We are going to vaccinate the nation, save, you know, essentially protect the most vulnerable, uh, save them from serious infection and uh, death. That's exactly what we've done. And I'm just so proud. It feels, you know, in many ways that I stand on the shoulders of those heroes who were delivering the deployment uh, program. Last uh, week, we got to 27 jabs a second, 844,000 in a single day, which was pretty remarkable. And we can, do, we can keep doing that as long as obviously we, we maintain supplies, which I'm confident we will. And we'll meet our targets from mid-April uh, of offering the vaccine to all over 50s and some under 50s in that big cohort, cohort six, which is 16 to 64 year olds, about 7 million people with underlying health conditions and then move on to phase two to offer it to all adults by the end of July. Despite the successes so far, there is still some fake news, some scepticism about the vaccine, particularly it seems among some of the black Asian and minority ethnic communities in the UK. How worried are you about this? You're quite right. There is some vaccine hesitancy. Uh, and although we lead the world, not just in terms of our deployment of our vaccine programme, but also in vaccine positivity, all the latest surveys uh, around the world demonstrate that the United Kingdom, uh, as the adult population in the UK, I think has uh, vaccine positivity at about 85 86% of UK adults saying they're very likely or most likely to take the vaccine. That's really, really positive, really good. But nevertheless, the, the, the very small minority, whether it's you know, 10 or 12 or 14% of adults uh, who say they are hesitant skew much more heavily towards uh, black and ethnic minority uh, communities, especially the black and uh, Afro-Caribbean community, the Bangladeshi community, the Pakistani community, which is why we're spending so much time uh, uh, and effort reaching those communities. I launched the uptake strategy on the 13th of February uh, last month, which basically operationalizes how we are essentially reaching uh, those communities, um, not just uh, with information, we've translated everything into 15 languages from Arabic to Farsi to uh, Hindi to Urdu to Polish, uh, but also uh, making the vaccine accessible through trusted places, whether it be Jesus Church in Brent or uh, uh, the uh, uh, Hamza Mosque in Birmingham or a temple or a Gurdwara or a homeless shelter. We're going to uh, those communities to try and reach out uh, to them, to demonstrate to them uh, that you know, people just like them are taking the vaccine and getting that protection. And that's making a huge difference. And of course, the third element of that 
is sharing data, sharing data with local government, with directors of public health, so we can see by postcode the uptake. And we want to make sure we reach all those groups because the one, the one thing we know about this virus is it'll try and survive by infecting communities to try and mutate. And any community that's left unprotected uh, uh, would you know, run that risk. And therefore, we have to really make sure we reach all those communities as quickly as we can. It also seems that some of those working in the care sector, caring for some of the most vulnerable people in our society, are less likely to take up the jab than the general population. Minister, where do you stand on no jab, no job for carers? So the, the um, uh, carers who uh, work in the um, category one of the nine categories that we began vaccinating uh, on the 8th of December, if you recall, uh, was those residents of uh, elderly residents of care homes. Uh, and I think, um, as Chris Whitty has said, as uh, Dr. Bolo, who's a brilliant uh, practitioner uh, in the NHS, said, it, you know, it is our duty. If you are looking after the most vulnerable people uh, to the virus in society, uh, and then it's our, your duty to get yourself protected as well when you're offered the vaccine. And it's a professional duty, in, 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 in my view, to do that. We're seeing the numbers increase every single day. Uh, you know, last time I looked at them, we were at 77% of those who work in social care, uh, in those uh, adult social care homes for the elderly have now received their first jab. Uh, we've just had a, a, a big push to go back in into those care homes, obviously, to do the second uh, doses as well. So you'll see those numbers increase again. But look, you know, uh, surgeons have to uh, get themselves protected against hepatitis B uh, uh, in their uh, ability to be able to conduct the very sensitive and important work uh, in, in surgery. And the same applies, I think, to those who have to protect the most vulnerable in our society. I think it's a, it's a professional duty. There's a lot of discussion at the moment about vaccine passports, some sort of certification which could help us return to normal life. Now, I'm aware there's a review ongoing in government at the moment, but just how comfortable are you with needing a vaccine to go to the pub? Well, I think the way I would answer that question is in really two halves. One is the international certification. So clearly a number of countries have indicated that they're going to require a vaccine certificate of some sort uh, for travel. And we've made the decision that we want to shape those protocols uh, and the vaccines uh, travel workforce uh, uh, is going forward under grant shafts to uh, look at how the task force, forgive me, to look at how we shape those protocols so that they are advantageous as advantageous as they can be for our citizens whether you're traveling for business or for pleasure and so operationalizing the technology to allow you like you do now with a pre-departure test where you can show proof that you've had the pre-departure test as we require it in our country when people come to our country that's the right thing to do i think we move forward on that the second half of your question which I think is, 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 is really what you're getting at with your question about the pub, is how do we use vaccine certification domestically in our country? The reason the prime minister, when he announced the roadmap to reopening the economy, actually said, look, we're gonna have a review because there are a number of difficult questions that we have to uh, think about, answer, and then work out which direction we're gonna go in, whether they're ethical questions, discrimination questions, questions around data protection, um, around you know, uh, longevity of, of the uh, protection from vaccine. But I think certification, whether it be for a vaccine or for a test certificate, because the, remember, a lot of the new testing technology now is rapid testing technology. And I think if it was, a you know, for me, uh, if it were a trade-off between you know, getting our economy back up and running, getting our lives back, and having to demonstrate that I've been tested before I can... Uh, go to a, a place where you know, I have to interact with lots of people and the, we know the virus loves that um, social interaction, that's how it spreads, uh, then I think that's an important review and it's, a, it's an important that we, you, know, you would expect no less from your government uh, that we look at everything and leave no stone unturned uh, to make sure we get as many of our, our freedoms back as quickly as possible. What about people under the age of 16? So I've got a question here from uh, listeners Jane and Joe, both asking if there's plans for, for children under the age of 16 to be vaccinated. So a number of the uh, uh, vaccine manufacturers, uh, Pfizer, uh, AstraZeneca, 
uh, uh, the Oxford team and of course Moderna are all uh, looking at uh, gaining uh, the regulatory approvals for their vaccines for uh, the 12 to 17 year old age group, so the adolescent age group. Uh, and we await, obviously, those are in clinic at the moment and the trials are going on. The regulators are independent of government, but if the regulator gives the approval and those vaccines are safe, um, uh, then we will make them available to uh, the 12 to 17 year old age group. Big old row in the last few days between the EU and the Oxford-based AstraZeneca firm, which uh, we're so grateful to for being such a key part of the vaccine rollout. Are you concerned that the European Union may block vaccine exports into the UK? Well, I think the um, statement, the joint statement between uh, ourselves and the EU was a really important moment, uh, and a moment that recognises that we have to work together to try and defeat this, this virus, this pandemic, that vaccine supply chains are global. Uh, you look at whether it be the Pfizer vaccine, which is manufactured in Belgium, but the, the lipid nanoparticle that carries the messenger RNA is ma manufactured in the UK in its millions. So without that lipid sort of delivery mechanism, uh, that vaccine, plus many, many other components, by the way, that go into that vaccine, or the Oxford AstraZeneca, vaccine or the Moderna vaccine or Novavax or any of the other vaccines. So I think actually we are uh, uh, you know, getting to a place where both sides recognize the importance of collaboration, of cooperation. We sent out 10 engineers to work in the Netherlands plant that's producing the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine at Halix uh, for ourselves and for the EU to make sure we get them up to the level of yield, level of vaccine uh, production. Uh, that we have here in the UK, because we want everybody, you know, no one is safe until we're all safe. We're not protected until the whole of the continent and the whole of the world is protected, which is why we're also putting 548 million into COVAX. And it's great to see the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine arrive in the Philippines and in the Ivory Coast and in Accra and Ghana, and 300 million doses are being manufactured uh, for those low income and middle income countries. And great tribute to the AstraZeneca Oxford team that they're not making a profit on that licensing. They're doing it at no profit whilst the pandemic is with us. Finally, Minister, if someone listening to you is still unsure if they should get the vaccine when their turn comes, what's your message to them? Vaccines, you know, putting aside the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic and how serious it is, and of course, if you, you know, the virus uh, is, is a horrible virus, uh, but vaccines save between two or three million people a year around the world, whether it's you know, eradicating polio or the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine. It's so important. Uh, the great thing about this vaccine is that because you know, money was no issue, because the world came together, it normally takes about a year to get a phase one trial up and running. Um, phase one trials were set up within weeks because money was no issue, because we were able to get volunteers. We've got 455,000 people came forward to volunteer for clinical trials in the UK. Uh, we were able to parallel the uh, different trial phases for the vaccines. And our regulator is one of the best in the world. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind. And they were the ones looking at all this data. They didn't cut any corners. They actually followed the same procedures they would follow. The only difference, because no money was no issue, uh, they had the ability to parallel the trials and therefore um, condense the period of time. I would absolutely uh, uh, say to anyone listening or watching, you know, when it's your turn, take the vaccine because it protects you. I took mine last Friday as did the prime minister. Uh, uh, my wife has been vaccinated. My parents have been vaccinated. My wife's parents have been vaccinated. It is so important that we protect uh, ourselves, our families, our communities. We're now seeing more data uh, that the vaccine has a real impact on transmission, lowering transmission. This is our way out and it's our way of reclaiming our lives and of course our freedoms. Okay, really appreciate your time today. That's Vaccines Minister Nadeem Zahawi talking to me, Johnny Jenkins.